All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to um, Monday's edition of the Geography Awareness Week 2020 daily webinars being hosted by California Geographic Alliance. Um, this is a, a new experience for us, a, a, a bit of an experiment, but with everybody um, in our own distance learning modes and, and remote working modes, I thought we might as well give it a try. So be gentle with us. Uh, I'm being assisted as we go through the webinar by Rihanna Maris, who um, will be manning the question and answer. In case you have questions, we should have time at the end of the webinar to take some questions. So um, go ahead and type them in there. And um, I did want to just welcome everybody on behalf of two organizations just to get started. Um, my name is Tom Herman, and I'm the director of the California Geographic Alliance. Um, you see there our website, calgeography.org. We are the oldest geographic alliance in the country, and um, since 1982, the CGA has been working with teachers, um, professors, all levels of education to try and um, promote and improve geography education. I also want to say hello and welcome on behalf of the California Global Education Project, which is um, now a, a, an ongoing partner and supporter of the California Geographic Alliance. So a big um, partner in, in supporting geography education. So welcome. Today's themes are going to be um, just, just kind of getting into the big picture of geography. So we're going to be talking about geography as art, science, and way of life. We're going to kind of think about what the discipline of geography is all about, what it includes, what it does. And you're going to get introduced to the two perspectives, spatial and ecological perspectives that geographers use, and get some, some practice in, in applying those to some real world situations. For example, we're going to answer this random assortment of questions um, during the webinar today. Uh, geographers do a lot of locational analysis, meaning deciding where things should go. And so geographers are perfect people to ask, why do I have to walk so far for ice cream when I'm at the beach? Um, a, a second very random question, why so many ships and what are they doing and what, what's that all about? Um, and then our third question is, what have our history books been hiding about the 13 original colonies? So we're going to apply geograph geographic thinking to, to these questions and, and um, explore a little bit about geography. So I, I hope you'll find it a productive and enjoyable um, 45 minutes. Hello to everybody that was able to join. OK, so now is when we hope our technology is working. Aha, we are able to advance a slide. First step is good. So um, just a quick orientation here. I'd like to use this slide to show you, you know, we're here in California. Um, I'm particularly down here near San Diego. I'm going to explore that a little bit more. So there's a lot of ways we could think about where I am in San Diego here or in California. I'm going to go ahead and launch Google Maps and get that view I just had on my slide. So one place you could say we are is here on the extreme eastern edge of the Pacific Ocean. Eventually, my computer will wake up and realize where I am and drop a dot right here around San Diego. If I zoom in a little bit, you see this white line. It's not, in most places, it's an imaginary line. It's imposed. It's not really there. That's the border between the United States and Mexico. And you'll see that San Diego is very close, very close to that border right there. Um, we're also on the extreme western edge of North America. So on the continent of North America within the country of the United States and, and the state of California, if I keep zooming in here, luckily I know where I am because Google's not going to wake up so fast. You can see here the city of San Diego, the gray color of all the built up urbanized space in the city. Um, I'll just keep zooming in here, getting closer and closer to my house. Okay, I am located right here in this area called City Heights. It's about equidistant from the San Diego State University in downtown um, San Diego. And if I just keep zooming in, 
this is where Google should be putting a dot right here on my house. I'm right in the back corner of the house. I'm on the edge of this big canyon, Manzanita Canyon, that runs right through the city. So I just wanted to give you a bit of orientation to, to where I am. Since um, in remote learning time, you know, remote working, it, it could be just about anywhere. So I mentioned that we are all geographers, or if I haven't mentioned. Um, oh, so can't see. Let me see if I can resolve this problem. People were not seeing the Zoom. We will try and figure out this technical difficulty. So when I went here, let's see, is everybody on the, the planet now? Okay, we're zooming into California. <laughs> we, do, we see, do we see the label Baja California? Oh, okay. Live demos, maybe not so good. We can live without this one. We can live without this one. Let's go back. Thank you for bearing with me, folks. Um, what I was going to do, and now see there's the, the um, dot mocking me here. I was going to just zoom in and give you an orientation to where I am. Um, just because the point of geographers um, kind of orientation is that we understand where we are in a variety of different scales. And so I wanted to just give us a common orientation of being not only in California, although maybe not everyone is, but also on planet Earth because, you know, these are relevant uh, bits of information for us. Um, it's a, a way to reflect on how we think about the world to remember that we're not just in our particular neighborhood or street, but also um, sharing a planet, sharing a state, sharing a county. Well, that didn't work so well, right? So um, we'll move on and we'll hope that other websites show. And uh, sorry that the way the webinar platform works I can speak to you, but I can't hear you speaking back to me. Um, but when you type these things in the chat, I can see the problem and try and, try and resolve. Um, okay, so let's try another web page and see if this works because I wanted to share this um, new website, geography.com, that the AAG and Esri worked on together. And that's not working for me either. Let's try it again this way. This is a new thing for geographers. Hopefully you saw that web page load. Now I'm really depending on positive uh, feedback. Um, it was exciting for, um, no, not seeing the, the, okay. Let's try sharing this again. I think I have to reshare. So now are you seeing the geography.com webpage? Okay, so if that's the most embarrassing thing that happens today, that won't be terrible. We can go back and look at um, Google Maps too, by the way, because now we know what's going on. You can also see that I like Formula One news. All right, so I'll just zoom right out. And I'm going to turn the satellite view on because that's what I like to do. And now we're zooming back in. Western edge of, the, of North America, eastern edge of the Pacific Ocean. I'm in the extreme southwest corner of the state of California. Okay, this is better. If we zoom in, we can see the city of San Diego built up around the San Diego Bay, right? We're gonna zoom in. I happen to live very close to where these two interstates cross, so you can see it on a map of the United States. Uh, I mentioned, by the way, I'm midway between San Diego State University up here and downtown. Now we're just gonna zoom right in on my neighborhood and my house. 
right there. So that, in case you need to come by and complain about the quality of this um, webinar, that's where you would do that. That's me right there on the edge of my little local canyon where I take walks and reflect on the world. Now let's get back to the, the discipline of geography. And now, now I've realized that PowerPoint and Google Chrome are two different screens to share. This is something one is important to learn. So in this um, web page that really just advertises the discipline of geography, it's got some great little phrases and some, some verbiage that really helps concisely explain what the discipline of geography is about. And this is something geographers have always struggled with is explaining what we do. And that's why I like to show a picture of a planet because we study the planet and all of the complex things that are happening on that planet that people need to be concerned about. To be able to live here sustainably and happily and comfortably, that's what geography is all about. So geographers study about place. Geography study about people. One of the, the definitions I've heard for the discipline of geography is it's the study of Earth as the home to people. I know some physical geographer friends who would beg to differ and say they don't really need to study people and they're still geographers. So, but for human geographers, geography is really about how people live on the planet. Geography is about exploration and about finding out how things connect, what's out there, where things are, and about mar marking those things down so that we can communicate to other people how things are connected, how things are arranged. Geographers are about storytelling. We actually explain to people what places are how places are organized, how places are connected to each other. We explain how location is important and what different choices might be available for organizing our world around us. And we're gonna talk a lot during this week about geography as learning. Hopefully we've got lots of K-12 teachers and um, hopefully some students too listening in. We're gonna have good guests, um, segments all about geography. So geography as a school subject, historically has been a little bit boring and people haven't always been so inspired by it. And there's a good reason for that. The teachers who are teaching geography now learn geography from teachers who learn from teachers who learn, you know, get what I'm getting to at in the 1800s. And unfortunately in school, we often have this um, reflection of geography as just being about pointing at maps and memorizing where things are. And actually what we wanna do during this week is see how geography is actually all about how things are dynamic, how things are relating to each other, coming together, and how these the ways in which the world works are very important for humans to be able to make decisions and operate on this planet that we all share. So geography is not just learning um, for the sake of learning, it's learning for the sake of decision making. And so we see geography as a science and GIS, which is geographic information systems. So, um, okay, now we will try to Switch back to the PowerPoint. Let's see if that works. Ta-da. Okay. I might have to do some catching up, but that's okay. So one of the things that I mentioned there is about um, geography being a school subject, geography being something that, that folks um, are learning in school and that I would, uh, venture to say they should be learning a lot more in school. And so that's a big part of what the California Geographic Alliance has always been about, is about encouraging people to um, learn more about geography and to really use the discipline in, with all of its tools and all of its perspectives and not just fall into this really simple thing of looking at maps and talking about where um, historical events occurred or talking about different countries and capitals or longest rivers and things like that, because we need to use geography to make decisions and to figure out how things work. So I wanna bring attention to something called geography for life, which is essentially like if you're a teacher, you'll say, oh, these are content standards. This is what students should learn. Um, but if you're a student, these are good um, insights into geography that your, your teacher might not know because um, unfortunately, teachers don't get a lot of training in geography because in America, we prioritize history 
and other social science subjects and don't necessarily ask our teachers to learn much geography. So it's not their fault, they, they're excellent teachers. Um, but if you're a student and you're curious about geography, you might have to push your teacher a little or bring some information into the classroom. And Geography for Life is a great way to do that. So in Geography for Life, um, the discipline is divided up into six essential elements, which you see there in the orange boxes. The world in spatial terms, places and regions, physical systems, human systems, environment and society, and the uses of geography. Under each of those six essential elements, if you click this link, and I'm not going to just because I understand now the complexity of it, um, but there is, if you search geography for life uh, standards, National Geographic, there is a website that I will show you in a minute that um, breaks these six essential elements down into 18 standards. And then within each of those 18 standards, there's a whole bunch of description and explanation about what the content of geography is about. And so what I really like about this is that the, the language is about geography for life, not geography for doing really well in a test or geography for um, getting a career because um, you don't necessarily know as a student yet what career you want, but geography, all, all of our students, and for that matter, all of our teachers are gonna be living on earth for the foreseeable future. So geography is a super um, practical and relevant topic for us to be learning a lot about. It's the one guaranteed thing, um, in addition to time, that we will be taking up space and living on the surface of the planet. So it's very relevant. So I'm gonna um, try to um, switch the share. Let's see if we can, I may be overburdening my computer. Okay, do you guys see that? Okay. All right, taking a minute to follow along. So um, here's the quote that says exactly what I was trying to express. Geography is for life in every sense of that expression, lifelong, life-sustaining, and life-enhancing. And so if we're scrolling down here, you'll see that the eight, 18 standards are organized in this right column under the six essential elements. And if you pick one, for example, um, let's say uh, standard 11, which is about human systems, the patterns and networks of ec economic interdependence. Um, you'll see some terms, some concepts included in there and some kind of benchmarks, what fourth graders, eighth graders and 12th graders maybe could or should be learning about this. And you'll see some concepts in here like location and spatial patterns of economic activities. So this turns out to be not just a random selection because I've got an example later where we're gonna look at this issue about locational patterns and locational choice in economic activities. So these standards here, which are not the standards, just to be clear, these are not the standards teachers are responsible for teaching by California law. Those are different, but these are standards that academic geographers People um, who spent their career in geography, like me, have sat down and thought and said, "This, if people are really going to harness the power of geography, these are the kinds of things they're going to need to know. So I just feel like this is a great place, a great resource for, um, for us all to be aware of and to use as, as we're moving forward. And, and this phrase here, in search of powerful geographic knowledge, this is um, the kinds of concepts that geography brings are not what's the capital of Romania, which by the way, I'm not sure. Um, it's how to apply spatial, ecological, environmental, geographic thinking, right? So if you were to go in that website and read the description of geography for life, what they end up saying is that geographers use two perspectives simultaneously, the spatial and the ecological perspective. And the spatial perspective, whoops, 
spatial perspective is just um, where things are located. But the ecological perspective is how do they work together? What do they have to do with each other? And so when we can locate things in space, when we can identify where borders are between countries or where the suburbs have um, spilled over outside of a city, we can ask questions about why there and not somewhere else. And what happens when that pattern becomes observable? What other implications are there for that? So we're gonna get back into those two perspectives, but I, I forgot that I loaded up something here, which, which will now um, really challenge our technological abilities. Um, but I did wanna give a shout out early on in this process um, for the San Diego State University Department of Geography, um, which is where I've been uh, located and affiliated since 1993. I do think I have uh, some SDSU geography colleagues perhaps online. So this is a video that um, some of our graduate students made a few years back. And so it's, it's both selling the idea of studying geography in college and, and particularly the idea of studying it in San Diego at San Diego State University. So I'm going to um, launch this video and then expect that it's probably not gonna play correctly for you and then fix that. Geography is a, an extremely dynamic and diverse science. And I kind of think of it as a holistic combination of the physical sciences and the social sciences. The San Diego is a wonderful place to study all the different topics of geography because we have an example of all of those focus areas right here. Human geography is really important. I feel like we're very good at drawing interconnections between complex issues around the world. With our analytical skills and critical thinking skills, we can really try to come up with solutions to a better understanding of what's happening around the world. The one sentence, I guess, that I would use to get myself excited about geography is this for creating and recreating spaces and the right that we all have to do that. But by creating and recreating our spaces, we create and recreate ourselves. come out uniquely prepared to uh, hit the ground running in solving environmental and social problems using advanced technologies. So geography is important because we get to see how people and the environment are affected by different factors and also how they are interconnected. So here in the Mexicali Valley, we have water scarcity. There's not enough water to go around. In areas like this, there's an abundance of water where some people have more access. Whereas just across the way, there's water scarcity and some have none to grow their crops with. It's a big problem and we'd like to learn more about how it works. At SCSU, the geography department has one of the strongest departments in geographic information science, uh, partly because we have many faculty, probably more than most universities, working in that area. And it's a great place to study because, uh, partly because that local community backdrop provides a good study laboratory. The way that I use GIS is to understand erosion and sediment pollution from Tijuana, Mexico, and how that sediment can impact an estuary downstream.
So we have students employed in a wide variety of environments, including uh, consulting, government, the National Park Service, academia, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service. We have students doing stormwater management in the city and county of San Diego and a number of other different um, faculty positions. We can combine all of geography together to really come up with innovative solutions to social and environmental problems around the world. All right, so I think that even worked. That's so exciting. Um, and, and I didn't expect, but having not been on campus since early March, that was rather nostalgic. Um, so uh, I thought I had a slide in here. It'll probably be um, inconveniently out of order, but I just wanted to make you reassured if you're like, that guy expected me to remember um, six essential elements and 18 standards that in fact, it's just two perspectives that we wanna think about, spatial and ecological right, where things are and how they fit together. But I also wanted to, to let you know that geographers only have one law, and that's Tobler's law, which is that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. It's just distance matters. So, okay, so when we talk about thinking like a geographer and we think about those two perspectives, it can be summarized into two, into rather three questions. So that spatial perspective, what's where? But then when we're thinking about the ecological or in the environmental perspective, why is it there and why care, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna now get into our, our questions that I promised we'd be able to answer. Um, and much to my surprise and maybe yours, I'm gonna use a TED-Ed lesson worth sharing that I was planning on. Um, this is a shout out to somebody who wasn't featured in that video. Uh, uh, a legend of SDSU geography, Arthur Geddes, who first explained to me about locational analysis of ice cream stands on the beach. And I was preparing to illustrate this and I came across this um, video that does a better job than I could. So I'm gonna go ahead and try and run this video. gas stations always built right next to other gas stations? Why is it that I can drive for a mile without finding a coffee shop and then stumble across three on the same corner? Why do grocery stores, auto repair shops, and restaurants always seem to exist in groups instead of being spread evenly throughout a community? While there are several factors that might go into deciding where to place your business, clusters of similar companies can be explained by a very simple story called Hotelling's Model of Spatial Competition. Imagine that you sell ice cream at the beach. Your beach is one mile long and you have no competition. Where would you place your cart in order to sell the most product? In the middle. The one half mile walk may be too far for some people at each end of the beach, but your cart serves as many people as possible. One day you show up at work just as your cousin Teddy is arriving at the beach with his own ice cream cart. In fact, he's selling exactly the same type of ice cream as you are. You agree that you will split the beach in half. In order to ensure that customers don't have to walk too far, you set up your cart a quarter mile south of the beach center, right in the middle of your territory. Teddy sets up a quarter mile north of the center in the middle of Teddy territory. With this agreement, everyone south of you buys ice cream from you. Everyone north of Teddy buys from him, and the 50% of beachgoers in between walk to the closest cart. No one walks more than a quarter of a mile, and both vendors sell to half of the beachgoers. Game theorists consider this a socially optimal solution. It minimizes the maximum number of steps any visitor must take in order to reach an ice cream cart. The next day, when you arrive at work, Teddy has set up his cart in the middle of the beach. You return to your location a quarter mile south of center and get the 25% of customers to the south of you. Teddy still gets all of the customers north in Teddy territory, but now you split the 25% of people in between the two carts. 
day three of the ice cream wars, you get to the beach early and set up right in the center of Teddy territory, assuming you'll serve the 75% of beachgoers to your south, leaving your cousin to sell to the 25% of customers to the north. When Teddy arrives, he sets up just south of you, stealing all of the southerly customers and leaving you with a small group of people to the north. Not to be outdone, you move 10 paces south of Teddy to regain your customers. When you take a midday break, Teddy shuffles 10 paces south of you and again steals back all the customers to the far end of the beach. Throughout the course of the day, both of you continue to periodically move south towards the bulk of the ice cream buyers until both of you eventually end up at the center of the beach, back to back, each serving 50% of the ice cream hungry beachgoers. At this point, you and your competitive cousin have reached what game theorists call a Nash equilibrium, the point where neither of you can improve your position by deviating from your current strategy. Your original strategy, where you were each a quarter mile from the middle of the beach, didn't last because it wasn't a Nash equilibrium. Either of you could move your cart towards the other to sell more ice cream. With both of you now in the center of the beach, you can't reposition your cart closer to your furthest customers without making your current customers worse off. However, you no longer have a socially optimal solution since customers at either end of the beach have to walk further than necessary to get a sweet treat. Think about all the fast food chains, clothing boutiques, or mobile phone kiosks at the mall. Customers may be better served by distributing services throughout a community, but this leaves businesses vulnerable to aggressive competition. In the real world, customers come from more than one direction, and businesses are free to compete with marketing strategies by differentiating their product line and with price cuts. But at the heart of their strategy, companies like to keep their competition as close as possible. Okay, so, I mean, I thought that was a pretty excellent example, um, illustration. I'm sorry they confused it with all that bizarre um, economic terminology like price cuts, but the bottom line is walking further than you need to to ice cream, to get ice cream is not socially optimal. So that was one of my examples there. Um, that my next example that I wanted to talk about in terms of thinking about how the spatial and the ecological perspective come together. Um, little bit different. You, you maybe have seen this um, website shipmap.org. So um, what this map, uh, what this website does is it's, a, a year's worth of ship traffic, 2012, it turns out to be, from January through December, all of the ship traffic in the world. So I'm gonna try and get this one on and just kind of take it in. Those little dots are all ships moving and you can see that um, the calendar is moving. We're in May, 2012, right? We can zoom in on California over here and get a sense for what kind of ship traffic is happening here. You see Port of Los Angeles, Port of Oakland showing up. You can really quickly compare the ship traffic there in the West Coast with the Gulf Coast and see that we don't have many ships. Um, you can also zoom out and look across at the traffic in, uh, on the East Coast of Asia and realize that's a lot of ships. Um, what this website also allows you to do is to look at the different types of ships. So now on, across the top, we're seeing container ships, dry goods shipments, liquids, which could be oil, it could be milk, it could be water, gas, natural gas, and vehicles. So now if we zoom back into California, we get a sense of what kinds of things are coming here in the port of LA. We can see a lot of container ships and um, liquids, which I'd imagine are oil. We can see a, a little purple dot here. Uh, one of the only things that comes into San Diego is cars. Also some um, bananas and pineapples, which would be considered dry goods, I believe. So if we, if we think about this, one thing about this map that's amazing is just all of these ships. And if you play the video, um, it'll tell you about that some of these ships are a quarter mile long. Um, so you realize the navigation to get these ships all around the world with all of these goods um, without crashing into each other and without just crashing into islands and reefs. It's very significant. But then you can also start thinking about all of those ships are carrying 
economic connections from place to place, places that produce resources like the United States that is now a net exporter of oil and natural gas. And that material gets loaded in ships and sent to places that are willing to pay the market price for those materials. So you see these as economic relationships, as um, supply chains. We can also go over here and turn on just the roots, right? So stop seeing all of the moving dots and just see where over the course of the year did the ships go, right? And then we can think about how there's still portions of the Southern Ocean that are very, very remote wildernesses, very infrequently visited by ships. And there are other areas that are essentially high traffic lanes. There's a lot of ships there and that's gonna have a lot of impact on the marine life. So again, thinking about the spatial perspective and the ecological perspective, this was just an example I thought was, was a little interesting. Um, we are gonna, Switch, I'm almost learning how this works. By Friday, it'll be really smooth. Um, so one more example, I worked on a fun project with an economist and a civics expert this year with the Los Angeles County Office of Education. And it was all about how to integrate civics, economics, and geography in the teaching of history. This is important because in California, we teach US history and geography and world history and geography and as I mentioned, the teachers haven't had much experience, much training in geography. So they tend to teach a lot more history than geography. And just to cut to the chase, we're all the poorer for it because we miss the insights that economics, geography, and a civic approach makes. So for, for my contribution, I wanted to get people thinking about how um, territory was a big issue for why the Americans or the colonists decided to um, fight the British for their independence. We use this compelling question of, was the American Revolution inevitable or could it have been avoided? And I would argue that the curtailment of the territory of the uh, colonies was the, one of the biggest issues that, that brought us to war. And so I wanted to look at and see some math examples. This particular map is from David Rumsey's historical map collection. Um, and it's a, from a centennial, celebrating the centennial of the United States, 1879 atlas. And this, as you can see from the title, map of the original 13 colonies. There's some really interesting information in here about the settlement of the colonies, the population in 1776, the cities where you can see all the cities were in the north. Also the battles of the, the revolution, not that relevant, but the troops furnished during the re revolution I thought were interesting. But I'm gonna focus in a little bit on this map. I found this really interesting label, the ancient French boundary. Now this is a map published in the United States in 1879, a map of the, the colonies that eventually became the United States. And somehow there's an ancient French boundary running through the middle of Virginia. Well, this coincides with this boundary shown here in a textbook map. This is a, a, a sorry, an Encyclopedia Britannica map. Um, and what this map is showing is the treaty line of 1763, where uh, France was involved, uh, along with the um, government of England, who owned the colonies, and who said, yes, France, we agree to this boundary as a way of trying to avoid war with France, but also trying to avoid irritating the Native American populations who were coming into contact with settlers on the Western frontier. So this map is what the territories really looked like in 1763 and between 1763 and 1776. This map would help explain why people were mad and ready to fight. This map here is not so much real, even though it was drawn 100 years after the events of the war. So what I wanted people to think about is that this map being drawn in 1879 and that boundary being called the ancient French boundary, that's an act of geographical imagination. That's imagining the territories in 1776. And in many ways, telling the, the story we wanted to tell. And that might be the best way to understand what the revolution was all about is us being able to narrate our own story on the continent. So there's a link there. If you look up uh, Los Angeles County Office of Education, you can get links to the um, article we wrote in the curriculum materials uh, that have to do with this. It's called Breaking Down Silos, the Case of the American Revolution. 
Um, and while I'm here on the slides, I also just wanted to make sure to give a shout out to National Geographic. Many years ago, and up until about four years ago, the California Geographic Alliance was uh, supported, as were alliances all across the country, by National Geographic. We don't have that direct um, funding relationship anymore, but we, we certainly still are partners. And National Geographic just provides a lot of resources for students, um, but also for teachers. So in that gap between um, what teachers learned in their training about geography and maybe what they'd like to be able to share with their students, uh, in that professional learning gap, National Geographic is providing some fun, engaging ways for, for teachers to learn new, new um, ideas, new perspectives on geography that they can bring into their classroom. So I just wanted to put that word out there. Later on in the week, I'll be featuring some more um, National Geographic projects and, and some work of their explorers. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, okay, there's totally out of sequence, my Tobler's First Law of Geography um, slide, but let's see if there's any questions or anything. I think it looks like the, the chat is fully functional and people are able to ask directly here um, we had Rihanna here thinking that it would be a back channel of questions and answers. 